Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Analytical Approaches to Advance Alzheimer's Disease Research, presented by Dr. Renee Robinson, Associate Professor of Chemistry at Vanderbilt University. I'm Dr. Susie Valdez of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lab Roots. Lab Roots is the leading scientific social networking website producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. <clears throat> we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. Type the questions into the drop-down box that appear on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located on the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process for obtaining your credits. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our presenter today, Dr. Renee Robinson. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Welcome, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Susie, and thank you, um, Tiffany, and the rest of the team at Lab Roots for this opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm very excited to share the work that we've been doing in my research group, working to advance Alzheimer's disease research, and this has been using analytical approaches. And so as you can see here from my title slide, um, the way in which we do that is we develop and apply high throughput proteomics techniques to study various aspects of Alzheimer's disease. So while we also look at aging and immunity and study health disparities in Alzheimer's disease in my lab, um, today I'm mostly gonna focus on the things that we've been doing with animal models of disease. In the United States, um, as of 2017, there were 5 million people that were uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So this is a very um, high number of individuals that are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out to be the sixth leading cause of death here in the United States. If you look at uh, demographics in terms of individuals that will go on to develop Alzheimer's disease over the next 30 years, then what you see is that this number uh, of 5 million individual sufferers will increase by a factor of three to approximately um, 50 million sufferers by 2050. So one in three seniors die from Alzheimer's disease or some related dementia. Um, and because there is no current cure for this disease, it becomes very expensive to treat and provide caregiving support. So currently that's estimated at $220 billion. And by 2050, that number will go up into the trillions. In terms of what we know about Alzheimer's disease with regards to um, pathology and the pathogenesis of disease, here I'm showing some examples of that. So if you look at a slice from a brain slice from a healthy individual compared to someone with Alzheimer's disease, you can see that there's significant shrinkage um, in the brain and atrophy. So there's a lot of neuronal loss. And in terms of cellular disruptions, we know that there's mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress plays a large part in why there is this pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. I wanted to highlight um, something that you may be familiar with, which is the formation of amyloid beta peptides. So if you look at this amyloid precursor protein, you can see that it's cleaved by these uh, beta and gamma secretase enzy enzymes to generate 1 to 40 to 1 to 42 uh, monomers of amyloid beta peptide. And the aggregation of these peptides result in the formation of senile plaques that you can see that progressively become enlarged um, and spread out into various areas in the brain with disease progression. And while there are other uh, aspects of the disease um, like tau tangles and other pathological hallmarks, I wanted to highlight this one because this is the one that I will be referring back to when we start to look at animal models of the disease. And so I'll talk more about that later, but you can see that these same senile plaques that would show up in the brains of human individuals can also be recapitulated in mouse models of disease. So while MLA beta and tau tangles have uh, been investigated widely as being uh, causes of Alzheimer's disease, at this point we still don't know the exact causes of the disease. And so in my group, we've been interested in looking at other peripheral sources um, of disease. And so it actually turns out that in the periphery, 
uh, organs such as the liver also provide sources of amyloid beta. And these uh, amyloid beta peptides that are generated there can be trafficked back to the brain. You can also see that there's the importance of the microbiome and other signals here in the uh, gut immune system as well as in the peripheral immune system that um, can leak across this uh, blood-brain barrier that um, is often leaking Alzheimer's disease and initiate a cascade of signals that lead to inflammation and other sorts of detrimental processes. So we've become interested um, recently in the fact that the immune system has been shown to be compromised in Alzheimer's disease mouse models and in patients. And interestingly, there were a few studies um, that have used things like statins or reconstituted high-density lipoprotein um, that have been effective in reducing amyloid beta in the brain, although the targets have been peripheral in nature. So this begs the question, what, um, you know, is the chicken or what is the egg? What are the initial causes of, of Alzheimer's disease? So my group, we're interested as a big picture goal to understand the brain periphery processes in Alzheimer's disease. And the way in which we're trying to do that is by looking at peripheral tissues such as liver, heart, kidney, lung, other tissues, blood plasma, and to track how proteins in those tissues change with disease progression. So looking very early at things that may be potential initiators and following them through the various stages of disease. And our goal is that we would be able to understand a lot about various different kinds of biological processes in this way, um, including things like energy um, metabolism. So with that sort of context in mind, in terms of the big picture goals that we have in the lab, um, we really realized that we had to focus our attention to developing technology that would be suitable to address these big picture problems. And so I mentioned that we use a mouse model of disease. And so we are using an amyloid precursor, a human double transgenic knock-in mouse model of disease. And so this model has uh, mutations in uh, amyloid precursor protein and also in presenilin. So these are familial uh, mutants that you can find in uh, certain families of uh, Alzheimer's disease individuals. And in this model, we've been able to build up a tissue repository where we've uh, looked at various stages of disease. So as early as three months, um, the animals are very similar to heterozygous wild type litter mates where they don't have any uh, uh, signs or indications of having Alzheimer's disease. However, by the time they get to seven months, they start to have early forms of amyloid beta deposits some uh, higher levels of oxidative stress. And at 12 months, 14 and later months, then they become very uh, advanced stage Alzheimer's disease um, and have several amyloid beta deposits in the brain. And so while there are many models that can be used to study Alzheimer's disease and some that actually recapitulate uh, more forms of the disease, this was the model with which we were uh, beginning our study several years ago. So in our tissue repository, what we've been able to uh, do is to take uh, different stage disease animals, the wild type litter mates and the uh, Alzheimer's disease mutants. And then we've uh, harvested from those animals, brain, liver, lung, heart, kidney, and other tissues. So we have at least six biological replicates for every uh, genotype and tissue at each disease stage. Um, and what's not reflected here is that we also have later advanced stage animals um, as well. And so I wanted to highlight here uh, what the analytical challenge is in terms of thinking about the fact that we have um, 180 samples with which we would like to uh, conduct a proteomics analysis. And so the question becomes, how do we best perform this experiment? Um, and so with this in mind, we began to think about ways that we could increase the throughput of our overall approach and start to do multiplexing. And so in this way, we, we've been interested in multiplexing to look at various uh, tissues uh, that come from diseased animals, but you might be interested in multiplexing for other sorts of issues or problems. So for example, if you have a really large clinical cohort where you're looking at hundreds, if not thousands of patients, then you might uh, be interested in ways that you can increase your analytical throughput. Um, if you're looking at multiple disease stages or time points, or you'd like to look across cell types or even study what the effects are from various drug targets, then you wanna have ways to do that in a high throughput way. And that's because as you start to look at the overall process for doing shotgun bottom-up proteomics techniques, that can be rather costly. So here, if you start with some sort of uh, tissue type, so in this case, it could be our brain, 
and you extract proteins from it, make peptides, you want to ensure that you get enhanced proteome coverage. So you take these peptides and subject them to multiple dimensions of separations often. So these are chromatographic separations. And then you do uh, mass spectrometry. We can get accurate masses and go on to do tandem mass spectrometry to get better uh, identification of the peptides in that mixture. This overall process, depending on the number of samples that you have, can be a matter of days, if not months, um, in order to cover that whole uh, cohort of samples that you would have. So for us, we've been interested in ways that we can minimize sample handling, that we can reduce the overall time that we're spending on the instrument um, while increasing the sample throughput. So being able to um, analyze the 180 samples that we're going after and look at ways that we can do this such that we can minimize the overall uh, financial costs, but also the costs associated with time and labor in terms of sample preparation and data analysis. So if you look at ways to do quantitative proteomics, there are a few approaches that I wanted to highlight um, that lead to the, the approach that we've developed in my group. So the first approach would be looking at a label-free approach in which you can simply take each individual sample through the pipeline that I just demonstrated. And you can use, at the end of the day, the intensities that you get from your mass spectra or your wild type and your disease animal in order to look for relative differences that change in those conditions. And this is a great approach because it doesn't require any additional preparation to the sample. Um, and theoretically, you could look at an unlimited number of samples as long as you have the instrument time to do that. However, with that comes the added cost of if you wanted to run um, 180 samples, then it would take you the entire uh, sample workflow time to process each of those 180 samples. A way to increase that throughput might be to use um, approaches which allow you to label samples. So here I'm showing you approach uh, SILAC, stable isotope label amino acid uh, culturing, where here you can incorporate heavy labeled isotopes of amino acids into your media. So here you can take two conditions, a light and a heavy. Um, they have the isotopic incorporation that occurs when the cells are harvested. You can mix them together. And now you have two samples for one. Um, if you're not working with cells and you want to do this with tissues, then you might do this post-digestion. So here you would generate your peptides from your wild type and your disease animals, and you would label them with some sort of tag where your wild type animal would have a light version of that chemical tag and the disease animal would have a heavy version of that chemical tag. And again, mix them together and you could do two for one. So these are nice in that they increase your throughput by a factor of two or up to possibly um, five with some recent demonstrations of dimethylation labeling for our isotopic labels. Um, however, you know, the limitation of this kind of approach is that with the more uh, heavy isotope uh, tag peptides that you have in this first uh, precursor mass spectrum, you can start to crowd that mass spectral space. And then um, if you look at the point at which you do the mixing, you have to make sure the samples are processed um, as similarly as possible up until this point at which you label and mix them together. A more recent um, approach over the last decade that has been developed has been one that has uh, addressed the issue of crowding in the mass spectral space by moving uh, the detection into the MSMS space. So these are isobaric tagging reagents where um, I will give you an example of how this can be done. And so this is um, tandem mass tags, but the same concept applies for eye track tags as well as dilucing tags or others. And the idea here is you have a chemical tag that has three major groups. One group is this um, group that's gonna react with your peptide. So in this example, you have an N-hydroxysacinamide uh, ester group that's gonna react with primary means of your peptides. You have a mass balancer portion and a reporter ion portion such that heavy isotopes, so uh, carbon-13, deuterium, um, nitrogen-15 can be incorporated into various regions of the reporter ion and mass balance. So in this example, you see a six-plex tag that's been created, six different reagents, and the heavy isotopes shift from the mass balance region over to the reporter ion region one at a time so that the difference in mass between each of these um, tags 
if you were to break apart this bond here between the reported iron and the mass balance would be a difference of one. So what you do is you take your six different samples, you tag them with one of these six different reagents, and then that lends themselves to your peptides being tagged. You mix the samples together, and now in your mass spectrum, you only generate one peak, and that one peak contains the signal from all six different versions of that peptide being tagged with the different reagents. You go um, and do MSMS with either collision-induced dissociation or high-energy uh, capture dissociation, and then you fragment this bond here. And so now you have your reported ions that show up 1 m over z difference in mass, and this is in the lower mass region of the mass spectrum. And the most critical thing is that you can use the intensities of these reported ions to report on the original concentration of the peptides in your mixture. And so this becomes really advantageous um, if you want to increase the throughput. And so now you can do, um, in this example, a sixplex, and with uh, current versions of the tag, an 11plex um, analysis becomes possible. So I wanted to highlight um, some of the things that you think about as an analytical chemist in terms of trying to make these uh, experiments work. So if we were to take our entire sample repository for our AD mass model system, where we have 180 samples, and we did a label free analysis using uh, a short um, five hour gradient in order to try to maximize the proteum depth that we get, then you can see that we would spend over 900 hours doing just a 1D LC MSMS experiment. If we wanted to really go after expanding our uh, proteum coverage and getting at uh, low abundance proteins, and we did some sort of fractionation experiment, either strong cation exchange fractionation or uh, high pH reverse phase fractionation. If we generated 20 fractions and reduced each LC reverse phase gradient to one and a half hour, now you can see we were spending 5,400 hours of instrument time uh, alone to run all those samples. And that's not including any quality controls, instrument uh, maintenance, blanks, or things like that. So this is a lot of uh, time invested just with uh, doing the data acquisition on the instruments. So you can uh, reduce that time by a factor two if you do one of the isotopic labeling approaches that I described earlier. So you uh, do a duplex experiment and reduce that 900 hours to 450 hours. If you have these isobaric tagging reagents where you can now go up to sixplex or tenplex, then we can actually reduce the time by a factor of 10 to uh, nine, our 900 hours now becomes 90 hours or 5,400 hours becomes 540 hours. So this becomes um, a bit more feasible because now we can do things on the order of uh, weeks or days. Um, but what if we could actually increase the throughput to get to a 60-plex analysis? So if we were able to pull that off, then with less than the course of a day, we'd be able to get information about 180 samples in our um, repository or even with doing very uh, in-depth protein fractionation and coverage, we could still, and adding in technical replicates, we could still do this over the course of about a week um, and a day. So that would be this 180 hour comparison. So hopefully you can see that there's a lot of motivation in order to develop these enhanced multiplexing techniques. So what I wanna do is walk you through one of the approaches that we've developed in my group, which is called Combined Precursor Isotopic Labeling and Isobaric Tagging or C palette, um, which I'll refer to hereafter. So in this example, um, a former uh, alum from the group, Dr. Adam Evans, he uh, came up with this approach in which we take um, six pairs of wild type and disease animals and split them into uh, groups of three. And so here what you see on the left part of this slide is that we've taken, uh, in this example, liver tissue from each one of these animals We've harvested it, extracted proteins, and we've generated a, a triptych digest mixture. And so we can use things uh, that are exogenous um, in order to spike in for normalization purposes like alpha casein. And then what we do is we lower the uh, pH of our buffer condition so that we can conduct a dimethylation reaction. And this is a reductive dimethylation reaction in which we add a dimethyl group to the uh, N-terminal amine of every single peptide. So this is selective targeting. And that leaves the primary amine of lysine residues open for tagging. So then what we do is we increase the pH of the buffer to slightly alkaline conditions. And then we use those isobaric tags. So this, in this case, uh, the TMT tag. 
and we take each one of these tags, half of the uh, reagent that's present in the vial, and we tag it with each one of these uh, six uh, samples that's in this group here on the left. So to the other set of six samples, we do the exact same chemistry with the exception that now our dimethylation includes heavy dimethylation um, tagging so that we have six deuteria, deuterium and two carbon-13 atoms that are present in the dimethyl groups that are added to the internal amine. And then we take the other half of that TMT uh, reagent vial and now we're adding it to those set of six samples. So all in all, we are able to mix 12 samples together into a single pot. And if you look at what that would look like um, in the first mass spectrum, then you would see pairs of peaks that we label light or heavy that are separated in mass by A Daltons um, for the uh, isotopes on the dimethyl group. And then we have to isolate the light and the heavy group independently so that we can do MSMS and get sequence information to identify the peptide. And in order to compensate for uh, co-isolation issues that often occur with precursors um, that affect the accuracy of the reported ion data, then we often do an MS3 analysis. So we further take a fragment from the MS2 and then get our reported ion information back. So we initially did a lot of tests to look at the figures of merit for this reaction. And this is an example where we designed an experiment where we set all of the uh, concentrations of the peptides in each sample to be exactly the same. And so here what you can see in this equimolar sample that we're able to detect changes across 12 different samples. So our light is on the left, our heavy is on the right. And then if you look at the spread in um, ratios that we get, if you just take any pairwise combination across here, then you can see that underneath our light and our heavy pair, they follow a nice Gaussian distribution. And on average, we have about a, a 16 to 20% error in our peptide ratios at this time. So this was in uh, 2013. And so um, we also looked at the dynamic range of this experiment to see what was the uh, limits in which we can accurately detect uh, differences in concentrations between any two reporter ion channels. So here you can see that uh, over the course of one to one up to 101, we were able to accurately detect changes up to about 50 to one. But once we got to 100 to one, uh, then we started to see a reduction in the signals that we got. So this gave us a sense that um, one, this experiment could work um, really well, and that two, we knew the bounds by which we would be able to quantify differences between our wild type and disease animals. So we developed a data acquisition platform on an Orbitrap uh, VLOS instrument at the time. And this is a schematic of the instrument shown here where you have the dual pressure linear ion trap and the Orbitrap mass analyzer. And what I wanted to point out was that um, in order to maximize what we could get from this experiment, we ended up using a sample prefractionation. So we use SCX fractions of our peptides. And then to each one of those fractions, we did six uh, reverse phase injections. And the idea there was that we wanted to have replication. So we had three technical replicates. And with the first set of injections, we focused on isolating the top one through seven intense ions in our MS precursor spectra. And then what we did was we had a second uh, set of triplicate injections where we focused on the top eight through 14. So the idea was that once we got most of the abundant uh, pairs isolated, we could go back and get the next tier of pairs isolated and try to increase the overall number of peptides that we could detect um, with information in all 12 report ion channels. So here you see some of the results that we get from doing this two-tiered um, acquisition approach. So we were able to um, measure over 324,000 uh, peptide spectral matches. And when we started to look at the number of uh, peptides that we could identify, then certainly the number of peptides by adding in that second tier a DDA approach allowed us to increase our total uh, peptide identification to 5,084 peptides. Um, what becomes really important in this experiment is, in addition to what we identify, is what peptides we actually can quantify across all of the 12 um, channels. So in this case, we were able to increase the number of uh, peptide pairs um, that contain 12 flex information to 1,800 by having this dual um, approach. 
So I wanted to spend a little bit of time to show you um, just some of the things that we can learn from doing this um, analysis. And so our first example was looking at um, liver tissue that we took through this uh, approach from our um, tissue repository. So this shows you actual data that we were able to get from this experiment. So here you can see an example peptide that has been uh, dimethylated on the N-terminalamine and TMT tagged on the lysine residue. This is a triply charged peptide here on the top left. Um, and both the light and the heavy uh, parts of this pair were isolated for MS3 analysis. So if you look down here at the MS3 spectra, then you can see that on average, this looks like a peptide in which the abundance of it is a little higher in the Alzheimer's disease um, tissue compared to that from the wild type animal. And so what we end up doing is we take all of the spectra that we generate um, in this capacity, and then we can look at the full changes of that protein from our disease animal compared to the wild type. So that's shown here in this um, plot on the right, where we've plotted the total TMT signal that was observed for that protein across all channels as a function of the log to change in ratio from AD to wild type. And so um, at this time uh, that we were doing these initial experiments, we identified about 1,700 um, proteins. Of that 1,100, we were able to get quantitative information and then when we look at um, those proteins that were most statistically different um, with 95% confidence between our wild type and disease, there were 64. And those are the ones that are represented here um, in red. And so I wanted to take a moment just to highlight um, for us what was really exciting about this experiment, which was that one, um, in an individual experiment, we we're able to look at changes from an individual, so we can follow what happens in an individual animal, but also look at the biological variation across the each disease genotype, which in this case was two. So this is all simultaneous monitoring of these multiple um, conditions. And then if you go back to looking at this uh, plot on the right that looks at the total uh, TMT signal, then you can see from the most abundant proteins at the top to the least abundant at the bottom that we were actually able to detect across six to seven orders of magnitude difference in the abundance of the abundances of the proteins in which we were monitoring. So we thought that was really um, exciting at the time. In order to um, compare how well we were doing with this 12-plex approach compared to um, other uh, quantitative approaches, what we did was we uh, went back and did a duplex experiment with um, proteins isolated from these tissues. And so in the duplex experiment, this is using dimethylation with the exception that now we're going to keep the pH of the buffer high. And this allows the dimethylation to uh, be incorporated at both the N-terminal amine and the lysine residue. So here we've taken our six pairs in all of our wild type animals where light dye, uh, the peptides were light dimethylated. And for all of the tissues from the AD animals, those were um, heavy dimethylated. So we have six duplex experiments. We went through and did a um, long comprehensive 1D gradient um, with MS, MS, and MS3 acquisition. And just to give you some examples of the data, here what you see across these 20-something um, proteins is that the levels of change between the AD and the wild type in our 12-plex experiment compared to that from this duplex experiment are very similar. And you see this for things that are higher in the AD animal shown on the top and things that are lower in expression in the AD animal shown here on the bottom. So that gave us really good confidence that we could um, believe the quantitative results that we were getting from our C-palette experiment. So what can you learn from this uh, really comprehensive experiment? So I'll give you one teaser of something that we were able to, to pull out of um, this experiment. Um, we know in the brains of individuals with Alzheimer's disease from PET scans that if you look at glucose of a healthy brain compared to diseased brain, that the amount of glucose metabolism is significantly lower. And this uh, lowered um, glucose metabolism, as it goes down with disease progression, the amount of cognitive impairment goes up and neurological function starts to go down. So this has been um, well established in, in Alzheimer's disease and is a um, 
clinically relevant um, pathological hallmark. Um, but for us, what became interesting was that we were studying changes taking place on liver tissue in these animals. And one of the things that our proteomics results revealed was that the levels of proteins involved in beta, uh, beta oxidation and ketone body formation were higher in the AD animals compared to those from the wild type. And ketone bodies are these small molecules uh, like beta hydroxybutyrate, acetyl acetate, that your body uses in periods of uh, lack of, of energy or starvation um, in order to uh, respond to lack of energy supply um, from glucose. And so uh, in order to compensate for that, what we believe happens is that the um, amount of ketone body formation in the liver goes up um, and possibly is used to help supplement the lack of glucose metabolism that's taking place in the brain. Um, and this sort of uh, hypothesis that came from our proteomic data um, agreed very well with some metabolomic studies in the same um, animal model that were also uh, being conducted at this time. Okay, so we've looked at how you can apply this multiplexing um, and look at changes that are taking place in one tissue at a time from wild type to disease. So we've been able to go on and think about other ways to use this multiplexing experiments. And this is the work of a finishing student, Christina uh, King, who has gone on to take uh, multiple tissues from this repository from our 14 month old animals. And what she's been able to do is to, in a single experiment, look at changes that happen within wild type or within a diseased animal across these multiple tissues. So this ends up resulting in 36 samples that um, she's going to look for proteomic changes across. And so if we are able to do 12 plex experiments, then that results in just three batches of total experiments that she runs. And what was important about doing this experiment was over this time, we were looking at different uh, upgraded versions of Orbitrop technology that we had access to. And so we wanted to see how much less we could do in terms of sample prep in order to maintain really high proteome coverage, but also to think about ways that we could get more quantitative information. So what you see that is that in these experiments, what we did was we looked at experiments on the Orbitrap VLOS that were done the same way that I described before with sample prefractionation and this two-tiered DDA approach and compared that to experiments where we didn't have any fractionation and where we were using uh, newer Orbitrap Fusion Lumos instruments at the time. So a little bit about the fractionated runs. Each one of our SEX fractions was subject to a two and a half um, hour gradient. And this was done on a 13 centimeter column that was packed in house. We incorporated that two tier DDA approach. Each full um, MS spectrum was done with 60,000 resolution. Um, and then we also did the CID MSMS for sequence identification. And then we implemented MS3 using HCD in order to uh, make sure that we were getting the most accurate of our uh, reporter ion information. And this data here just gives you a snapshot that we were able to uh, get this experiment to work really well. So this is an example peptide from malate dehydrogenase. And you can see again, it's dimethylated on the intermalamine, TMT sixplex tagged on the lysine residue. We can see the pairs of peaks that show up in the precursor spectrum. Um, and then we are not showing you the MSMS spectra here, but if you look at the MS3 spectra, then you can see these reporter ions that show up at low intensities. Um, and what's nice here again is that in this individual experiment within one animal, we can follow how malate dehydrogenase changes in heart tissue, brain, and liver tissue. So you can see that the, level, the levels of that protein um, go down as you go from heart to uh, liver tissue. And this is true in the other biological replicate that we looked at over here on the right underneath the heavy peak where the behavior um, is very similar. So in this experiment, we had three batches that we took through this process. And across these three batches, we um, generated millions of spectra, uh, both at the MS level, MS, MS, and at the MS3 level. And overall, we identified um, 2,600 uh, unique proteins, and a little less, or a little more than half of those proteins, we were able to get really good quantitative information across all 12 channels. 
And I want to highlight that this total experiment took up 15 days of uh, instrument time, um, but this doesn't include things like quality control, um, you know, and, and instrument maintenance that also had to take place. So in reality, it actually took a little more than a month and a half to generate these data. And again, what can you learn from this um, experiment? So now not only can we study uh, metabolism that's taking place in the brain, we can actually look at glycolysis taking place across the entire uh, system. And so here, as an example, we have the glycolytic pathway. We were able to detect most proteins, if not all proteins, in this particular pathway. Um, and one of the things that jumps out is that for a number of these proteins, you can see that the uh, level of the protein is lower in the brain and the heart in the AD animal compared to the wild type, whereas in the liver tissue, so I'm looking here at glucose 6-phosphate isomerase, the levels of that particular protein are actually higher in liver compared to uh, the brain and the heart. So this gives us a glimpse of what overall um, the metabolism is looking like in our Alzheimer's disease animals across multiple tissues. So we've been able to um, test and apply the C power technology in different realms. And one of the things that we, um, I guess, uh, saw as challenges um, as we were doing these experiments initially, especially on the Orbitrapulose platform, was that we were very involved in terms of the amount of effort put into sample preparation with really making sure we were picking the right number of fractions and spending the right amount of time separating the peptides in these fractions with reverse phase analysis. And this is absolutely necessary um, on this instrument platform in order to actually observe high numbers of peptides in which you have quantitative information for all of the, the samples that um, you're interested in. Other challenges of doing this on the lower res uh, instrument is that we have really long uh, duty cycles. Um, and so that means that less of the samples are actually being uh, sampled. And so we're missing out on information there. The MS3 port eye intensities that we uh, detected um, in many cases were low. Um, and so we couldn't get good quantitative information in those cases. Um, also because those intensities were low, we were missing uh, data for many of the channels which um, you know you can interpret that as in some cases, is that due to biology or is that due to just us not detecting it? Um, and then the other thing that became really important was the number of pairs that we actually observed. So again, for this C palette experiment to work, we have to observe um, data in both the light and the heavy um, pairs that we um, generate. So we were able to get access to uh, Orbitrap Fusion Lumos instrument. And the main thing that I want to highlight with this um, technology is that you really can play around with where you do your um, MSMS and your MS3 and where you detect those MSMS and MS3 spectra. So you can either detect them in ion trap or in the Orbitrap, lending you uh, many ways to increase the duty cycle of your experiment. The other thing that um, we looked at with this uh, Orbitrap uh, Fusion Lumos instrument is the ability to do synchronous precursor selection in the ion trap. And here's a way in which we can take multiple CID MSMS fragments instead of a single one and isolate those for further MS3 um, fragmentation and observe them. So that was a way in which we were um, trying to optimize increasing our reporter ion signals. So quickly, the initial test that we um, did here was to take the same set of samples that Christina generated across multiple tissues and now do an experiment on the Fusion Lumos instrument that did not involve any uh, sample fractionation with SEX. And so you can see here, we chose gradients that were 105 minutes and we moved to a longer um, in-house pack column. We operated this instrument using a top speed mode of three seconds instead of top end. Um, and then again, we did the uh, MSMS and the ion trap and MS3 with HCD um, using the synchronous precursor selection where we took four of the top MSMS fragments and then subjected them to MS3. Okay, so here you can see um, that we are able to get very similar data on both platforms. So this is looking at 
Um, our favorite protein, malate dehydrogenase, a peptide from that one where the chemistry is still working. And immediately what you see for this example peptide is that the overall reporter ion intensity that was observed with the VLOS using one MSMS fragment, so single notch, is uh, nine tenths to the fourth, whereas over here on the fusion lumos, where we could do the uh, synchronous precursor selection, um, now the signal has increased by a factor of 100. So this was a dramatic improvement um, in terms of MS3 signal, but it also um, hopefully allowed us to identify even more uh, peptides that we could get quantitative information. So here you can see that in each batch that we ran this experiment, um, we ran it where we can look at the number of proteins that were identified from our light dimethylated pairs versus our heavy dimethylated pairs. And we have that for three batches. That all in all, when you look at this blue um, histogram from the VLOS experiment, we identified 2199 proteins, and this is with 20 SCX fractions, whereas with the uh, LUMOS, without any fractionation, we identified 1531 proteins. So we were pretty excited about this, and we really wanted to figure out ways that we could start to optimize this fusion LUMOS experiment. In terms of total time, we went from a 15-day experiment to an experiment that was done in less than half a day, so 10 and a half hours. So that also was really exciting. We um, went back and did another layer of experiment where we also did fractionation with the fusion lumos. And so now we're comparing um, eight fractions that we did on the VLOS with eight fractions that we did on the lumos with no fractions on the lumos. And this is just looking at protein uh, groups that we identified. And so you can see that one, we identify way more proteins with the fractionated LUMOS data than we do with the other two approaches. Um, but also that without having the fractionation data, we can generate significant numbers of proteins. So all in all, we've been able to look at 6,000 proteins um, across these multiple um, tissues, um, which has been really exciting. And we've been looking at ways that we can significantly reduce our data acquisition time. So I wanted to um, highlight that in addition to thinking about cost in terms of data acquisition time, we also have thought about cost with regards to uh, actual cost of the reagent tags. And so uh, we've been excited to work with um, Professor Ling Zheng Li and Dr. Dustin Frost at Wisconsin Madison on using um, the high res dilucing isobaric tags that they have in their laboratory. And if you look at the structure of these um, tags, they're very similar to what I show with the uh, tandem mass tags, except here we have a different amine reactive group and the reporter ion group um, is also different using the uh, leucine And so in this version of the tag, they have 12 different uh, 12 different versions, and these 12 different versions incorporate different heavy isotopes with carbon-13, deuterium, nitrogen-15, or oxygen-18 into the reporter ion region. And you can see that it requires really high mass uh, resolving power of the MS instrument in order to uh, detect these 12 different um, peaks because the mass differences between the isotopes is on the order of six or so um, millidalton. So we took um, uh, these tags and worked with her lab in order to apply them to yeast samples um, in order to do a first 24-plex analysis. And so this gives you an example of the work that we were able to accomplish. So if you look across this first MS spectrum on the top, we can zoom in on this set of pairs labeled with uh, blue and orange. And so here we see an example peptide pair our light dimethylated peak on the left, the heavy dimethylated peak on the right. And now you can look at the MS, MS spectrum and see we've identified this uh, short peptide with both the light and the heavy MS2 uh, data. And then if you look at the MS3 spectra, then you can see this beautiful set of um, peaks that shows you that we were able to get 24 flex detection from um, this G set of samples. So we're really excited about this um, experiment. This was recently published in Analytical Chemistry. And this gives you an idea that um, we're you know, constantly working to improve the numbers of uh, proteins that we're able to quantify with this approach um, because we identify more, we identify more than what we quantify. But each time we do this, we've been able to quantify more of the proteins that we see. 
And more importantly, what you see here on the right is that we can very accurately get good quantitative information. So um, here on the top right, what you see is a 24 plex analysis where all of the channels were set to be one-to-one -one compared to each other. So you can see the overall variation here um, is uh, less than 10%. And then if you look here on the bottom, again, we can see the accuracy and the approach where we've intentionally spiked different um, channels to have different ratios in them. And you can see that these are behaving very similarly to what it was that we spiked in that experiment. Okay, so I'm coming to um, a close here, but I wanted to show you other ways in which we can probe Alzheimer's disease using this enhanced multiplexing technology. And the last example is one that um, takes the technology and allows us to look for oxidative modifications. Um, as I indicated in the first slide way back, um, oxidative stress is a very um, important pathological hallmark of disease. And so um, briefly what we, also, I've been interested in the lab is looking at S nitrosylation. And you can see that S nitrosylation of proteins is very important for normal neuronal signaling, um, for differentiation of neurons, for development, survival, and plasticity. However, when the levels of uh, nitric oxide um, are elevated in pathological conditions, then you start to have other proteins being modified that wouldn't typically be modified. And this leads to issues with protein folding, mitochondrial dysfunction, neuronal damage, and severe um, ER stress. And so we've been taking the C-Palette technology and modifying it so that we can study these oxidative modifications. And really what I want to highlight on this uh, complex slide is that what we can do is we can take each of our reporter ion channels and look at different uh, chemistry. So here what we do is we take the same tissues that I've talked about before, these wild type and disease tissues from this mouse model. And in one example, we can uh, reduce all of the cysteines that are present in that tissue with a strong reducing agent like that thiothritol. And what we do is we're able to use uh, thiocephalol 6B resin in order to capture uh, cysteine-containing peptides on a resin. And when we have them captured on the resin, we can do all of the same chemistry that I just talked about with the C-Pilot. So we tag uh, with dimethylation and TMT tags on the resin. And what you see here with the 126 and the 127 report ion channels is that these are ways in which we actually measure the total protein abundance that's present uh, for cysteine containing peptides. And the other channels, 128 through 131, these samples from these channels have been selectively reduced uh, with the scorbate. So we've blocked any free um, thiols within ethyl maliamide. And then the ones that are S-nitrosylated, we've selectively reduced them with the scorbate. And so now those become available to be captured by our resin. And then we can do the same sort of TMT tagging. So the nice thing about this uh, complex experiment is that we can get information about total changes in protein level, changes of, of this specific SNL modification, and we can do that across wild type and disease animals. So just a quick test to show that that um, actually works. Here's an example of a peptide from peroxyredoxin that has this cysteine at the 96 position. And what you see here, if you look at the MS3 spectrum, is you see total cysteine signal being detected, but nothing taking place in the report of ions between 128 to 131. And this actually uh, makes sense because peroxyredoxin hasn't been reported to be s nitrosylated but to have one of these acidic forms um, that takes place. When you look at other examples of a peptide, so this is one from this protein here, at this position, uh, 178 of the cysteine, then you can start to see levels of SNO starting to be detected. So we're really excited about the flexibility of this approach and ways in which we can study oxidative modifications. And you can see here from this quick snapshot that the, um, the numbers of s nitrosylated proteins that we identified um, was very high compared to those from other reports in the literature. So we're this top left quadrant. Um, 56 of the sites we identified were consistent with these other studies, but we also identified almost 80 new s nitrosylated sites that haven't been reported before. And these sites um, are from uh, proteins that are involved mostly in metabolism and also in cell signaling. 
So I've taken you through um, how our group has uh, successfully been using um, analytical chemistry and more specifically um, enhanced multiplexing techniques to study Alzheimer's disease. Um, this has been very useful for allowing us to look at changes across disease stages, multiple uh, conditions and across tissues um, and to do it in a way where we're able to um, do it high throughput and also maximize the amount of cost that we're putting into each experiment. Um, we've been able to make this work on different uh, kinds of Orbitrap uh, instrument platforms. And so when we use the VLOS lower resolution platforms, it requires that we do a lot of sample prefractionation and two-tiered MS acquisition. And I, I want to add that while it seems like a large cost in terms of the time to do this, again, we're doing it with 12 uh, samples in a single experiment. So whatever time we're spending on sample prefractionation and uh, increased data acquisition is still substantially less than if we were doing um, a label-free or a lower plex uh, labeling experiment. Um, by going to the Orbitrap Fusion instruments, we've been able to um, reduce the amount of sample fractionation that we um, do. And that's been afforded by the increased protein signal that we get from synchronous precursor um, selection. So we've been very excited about being able to do that and in different systems, so yeast and in um, mice. Um, and lastly, I hope I've shown you that this approach is very flexible and so it can be adopted and modified so that one can study oxidative post-translational modifications. With that, I would like to thank um, all of um, our team, the RAZER team that helps to make all of these experiments possible. Um, we mostly highlighted a lot of the work that um, Christina King has been doing and that from former alumni in the group. Um, I'd like to thank our collaborators, especially um, Dr. Lee and Frost at Wisconsin Madison for helping with the 24 Plex um, dilute experiment and then all of our sources of funding. Thank you all so much for your time and attention and I'm very excited and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Robinson, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation screen. Type your question into the box that appears on the screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's take a look at some of our viewers' questions. Dr. Robinson, what is the benefit of MS3 for your reporter ion detection, and how is that different with the two Orbitrap instruments? Um, thank you. So, so MS3 really helps us to get the most accurate uh, reporter ion information that we can get. So oftentimes what happens at the MS1 level is that the peptide that you're interested in isolating um, also can have peptides that you're not interested in isolating that get co-isolated with it. And so that ends up being reflected in the MSMS -MS spectrum where your reporter ion intensity actually comes from two different peptides instead of one or multiple. And so the MS3 really helps to uh, reduce that interference from co-isolation by taking a fragment from your MSMS -MS spectrum and then fragmenting it further to get hopefully a clean uh, MS3 spectrum. That, that the intensity is only reflective of the um, protein or the peptide that you were interested in initially. Um, I think the second part had to do with the different instruments. So with the Orbitrap VLOS instrument, that instrument only lends to you being able to take one MS, MS fragment and then take it for, for MS3 analysis. And the benefit of the MS3 um, capabilities on the Fusion Lumos is that you can take multiple MSMS -MS fragments and then move those four for MS3 analysis. So the big gain is that your signal goes up um, dramatically by taking multiple MSMS -MS fragments and then doing the MS3. And that was one of the examples that I showed you in the talk um, where we saw our signal go up by 100 times going from the VLOS to the um, Fusion platform. Thank you for that. And how do you account for differences in signal across multiple batch experiments? 
Yeah, so I didn't really spend time um, going over that, but these are very, um, you know, very complex experiments. And so one of the things that we typically do is we either spike in um, a peptide or protein that is exogenous to the system that we're looking at um, as a way to normalize our data at different steps. Um, oftentimes we'll use a pooled sample that is comprised of all the samples that we're interested in, and then we can spike or use that as one of the uh, channels in our experiments. And so now with being able to use like TMT 10plex or 11plex um, tags, we're able to incorporate um, more of those pool channels for data normalization. But yeah, really good question. And Dr. Robinson, we have one more question. Have you considered enrichment or antibody pull downs to increase the concentration of S nitrosylated proteins? Yes. So, um, so hopefully, what you can appreciate and what I showed you is that mm -hmm. the um, intensities of the S nitrosylated uh, peptides were uh, low in comparison to the total cysteine levels. Um, and I didn't mention it, but in fact, that is with using 10 times the amount of starting material for the s nitrosylate peptides compared to the non. So in this case, with our repository, we're not as sample limited, so we can make that work, but that wouldn't always be possible if we're looking at other uh, tissue sources. Um, we did do enrichment in the experiments that I talked about. So the enrichment that we did was to use a thiol resin, um, and this resin captures the free uh, thiol-containing peptides. Um, we hadn't quite looked at antibodies yet, but I think um, it could be helpful as another layer um, to make sure we can beef up the signals from those s nitrosylated um, containing proteins. Yeah, thank thank you. you. And Dr. Robinson, did you want to provide any closing remarks for our viewers today? Um, so I really just think, um, you know, that it's really important when you're trying to answer really big uh, big problems, I guess, in, in your research. I'm um, gonna think about ways in which you can um, optimize the analytical chemistry that you're doing. Um, hopefully I gave you one example of how we've been able to do that in our lab effectively, um, but we really think this is an important problem um, to tackle. Um, so um, hopefully you can appreciate some of the things that we've done, but we're really open to hearing other suggestions or feedback that you all may have about things that you've been able to get working in your lab as well. So just thank you for tuning in and um, thanks for your attention. And Dr. Robinson, thank you again for your presentation and for your important research. I'd also like to thank Lab Roots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I wanna remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January, 2019. You'll receive an email from Lab Roots letting you know when the webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.